All right, welcome back again to The Contrarians. Martin Popoff here. I've got a great guest with me in Bob Wagner. Um, and uh, we're going to be talking some Max Webster. Um, and there's a good reason I have Bob on for that. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, but the idea here, uh, this is uh, this is our uh, version of our show, The Contrarians, where, um, you know, this is one we just came up with a little while ago, where, where the idea was, um, what actually is the most contrarian album by a band? Before we actually did it as... Um, you know, our very earliest concept was uh, was uh, somebody on the team. Uh, this was their favorite album by a band, and it's a contrarian choice. But no, this is just more like universally. That's going to come up in a minute. Um, what is uh, considered the most uh, the most contrarian choice of the band? And the reason I have Bob with me is Bob is the author of this massive book, Max Webster High Class. You can get it at highclassmax.com. It's selling really well, which is great to hear. Uh, it is a killer, killer, huge coffee table book of uh, 380 odd pages, um, full color throughout the entire Max Webster story. Uh, I don't know, Bob, what does this thing weigh? Is it uh, seven pounds, six pounds, it, five pounds? It it's is, a lot. Yes, it is six pounds. Six and pounds. Yeah. Yeah. In it, yeah, it's it sounds it doesn't sound as bad if you do it in metric. It's <laughs> two and a half kilograms. <laughs> yeah, it's it it is it is a really cool book. I mean, it is as as he says on the front is the definitive story of uh, history of Max Webster. Bob's a, an a amazing scholar on the band and uh, maybe doing uh, some other things on Max. Maybe we won't get into that, but uh, but yeah. So tons and tons of photos, all the albums. Um, you know, reviewed and talked about in a lot of detail, all the touring history, everything is in here. Again, this is at, at high class max. And Bob, I understand it is it is selling well, eh? It's okay, yeah. I mean, I mm -hmm. had a, about a thousand copies printed and I've cleared 400 sold. Yeah. So it's That's doing wicked. pretty well. Yeah. 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 People don't know this, but Bob put on an amazing launch party for it too, where all the Max guys showed up. Um, Kim, Kim is endorsing the book. He signed a bunch of them too, right? Yeah, there was a hundred box set versions that are sadly all long gone. Yeah, and uh, yeah, five of the guys signed those. It was uh, it was fun. I put together a box set of you know of little little trinkets. You know the you know a little a coaster that was a forty five A and B side, and a nice. ticket stub was a bookmark, and there was a set list written by Gary McCracken on the Million Vacations tour, yeah. and and um, you know the sticker of the first album. Um, you know, the, the first album lineup, the one that they stuck all over Canada when they toured. And so just put this, get, put together a box set and it was a lot of fun. Yeah. And, uh, but those are long gone. So there's about 600 of the books left and, yeah. but uh, we'll see how it all goes. And if it, if it sells, if it keeps going as it is, there'll be a second printing and I may end up doing a second edition because people are sending me photos and all kinds of artifacts and things. And I could just take a month and do another redesign, just do a completely different, or largely wow. different version of the book. I don't know. I was going to say that, you know, having been in this business and done a lot of this kind of thing, I mean, it's to put this back on the press is, is a big deal to run it again. But so that's why people should jump and get, you know, the remaining 600 copies of this, because, you know, it's, it's a lot of extra work to put it on back on the press. And it's, it's even more expensive yeah. to redesign it. Right. <clears throat> to, to, yeah. It's just a time really to do yeah. it. And, uh, but it would take me a month or whatever it would be. And, mm -hmm. but so much of the stuff that you, that you've done is you already have your systems in your brain of how you do yeah. this stuff now. And I've, I've, I've pretty well understand the process now. So it wouldn't be nearly as much work to do it the second time. I don't yeah. think. Yeah. And, um, but I'm sure there's always unexpected delights that will show up, um, you know, along yeah. the way, yeah. but, um, but you learn a lot the first time. So it's probably not as much to do the second time, but I don't know. But it'll be it'll be so much fun to do another one because I'm getting all this cool stuff, not just photos. But I mean, yeah. someone just sent me a set list for the Mutant Family Sleep Tour at Hamilton Place, and they scanned it in for me, my pal Jackie, and just so cool. All these nice. things are just showing up now. Yeah. So yeah, to do a redesign of the book, I would you know it, it might take longer than a month. I don't know. Yeah. But uh, I would so enjoy doing it. Yeah. So nice. we'll see. People buy the book, and then you'll get a second edition too. Exactly, buy the exactly. book. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah. So the idea here is, uh, you know, Bob and I talked before, you know, Max Webster doesn't have a super long catalog, but um, basically we decided that uh, this is the most contrarian album by the band uh, or, you know, the album that is the biggest outlier from the band. So, yeah, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Why, Bob, is this uh, the outlier of the Max Webster catalog? 
Well, first of all, if you notice, there's only one Ben member on the front. Yeah. <laughs> and um, which, as far as I understand, Kim was actually not very comfortable with being pushed out to the front like that because it was always a band. And and uh, so who knows how much of that was done with with his his consent and all that. But here he is, though. He's being pushed to the front and it's becoming less of a band and more of a person. But man, you listen to that album. And as we know now, the wheels are coming off. I mean, you know, this is towards the end of the band's career, but you listen to this album, it does not sound like a band that is starting to fall apart. You've you've got three of the four, well, really four of the five, if you include Pi as lyricist, you have four of the five band members still in the mix, and it's a heavier album, but there's no Terry Watkinson. So it's a very different album. Bob, and, let me just uh, jump in here for a sec. I was maybe a yeah. bit remiss not to mention. So essentially, they have a debut album, uh, a self-titled in 76. They have High Class and Borrowed Shoes in 77. They've got Mutiny Up My Sleeve in 78. They've got A Million Vacations in 79. And then this is the last album. So it's the last of five albums. This is the end yeah. of the career, right? So, so yes. Back to you. So yeah, that's okay. And And they always, most albums, they had the lineup change. But really, but the previous two studio albums and the live album had the same lineup, and then you lose Terry Watkinson. So that's what makes this the outlier, is that the band's sound really changes without him. And uh, not for the worst, certainly, because um, it becomes heavier and, you know, really influential on metal players like Paul Gilbert. I mean, that was, there was some serious shreddy 1980s, you know, that, that came out in 1980, just very shreddy. No one was really doing stuff like that. If you look at the metal that was happening, then, you know, Judas Priest and, you know, early, early Maiden and all that, just there wasn't, that kind of stuff didn't really exist yet. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and Mitchell kind of paved the way for that kind of stuff. So that's what that's so, yeah, you lose the Terry Watkinson thing and though all those, those less textures of keyboard, all that kind of goes that, that airy side of what they do kind of disappears mm -hmm. Uh, but we, what you get in exchange, though, is a just really balls to the wall, heavy, great, great album. But it's a bit of a different band then, because uh, you know it's just it's it's not quite the same. In any band, you you take you take any one band member out and you you replace them, and it's never quite the same thing. I mean, mm -hmm. close to the edge to Tales and Topographic Oceans, it's it's not it's you know people have their preferences. It's just different. And I like both those albums. I love both those albums. And then Relayer comes after that, and then other member changes. And just the aesthetic of a band will change when you change the people. And in yeah. Max Webster's case, yeah, that's your single biggest lineup change. Yeah, is, and on the back, when, it says when, it's essentially a trio with a lyricist, right? So you have Kim Mitchell, guitar and vocals, Gary McCracken, drums, Dave Miles. So you've got you've got the, the core members besides Terry, you know, the classic lineup members. And then you've got Pi Dubois on lyrics, which is cool. Yeah. And uh, yeah, also playing with the Websters, it says, or Doug Riley, who's a, who's a known sort of session Canadian uh, uh, keyboardist guy. Of course, you got the three members of Rush mentioned because there is the song Battle Scar on here, which is a big tour de force with everybody together uh, playing live. Uh, Terry is just sort of a guest on here and then Dave Stone. So you've got literally three keyboardists as, as guests and you've got this yeah. curious production from Jack Richardson, who's a famous Canadian producer, but he produces it very, um, very sort of a high fidelity, but not heavy rock or raw or anything. I, it always reminds me of, uh, I always uh, remember this when I see, uh, you know, when I think about this production, it reminds me a little bit of uh, how Pat Travers complains about the heat in the street production. He finds it a little too, mm. I don't know, claustrophobic or just sober or something like that. And Smooth. this sounds very sober, uh, even though it's a guitar -y album, right? Yeah, I think yeah. there's a quote from the time where, where Mitchell, he describes as having a bit of a West Coast smoothness. Hmm. to the sound okay and uh i was never quite sure what he meant by that but 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 from but from listening to that or hearing that or reading that quote yeah you can see if someone was going for a heavier sound i mean i mean the drum sound doesn't have you know i mean of course a decade later but just picture the black album by metallica that huge drum sound that lars has that's right. not on universal juveniles and you could mm -hmm. get big drum sounds and of course listen to when the levy breaks that's a decade before that Mm -hmm. So of course people knew how to mic drums and get those big sounds, and um, but that but that was the sound they had. The engineer on the album was uh, was David Green, and but he was a New York guy out of the '60s, and just you weren't going to get that giant, huge, 
um, you know, he, 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 he produced these eyes by the guess who, and he worked with Connie Francis and Miles Davis. And just, he wasn't a heavy rock producer type or, you know, an engineer type guy. Yeah. So that's kind of, so you have all these elements of, of the, the sound coming from different people who are working on it, but that's mm-hmm. what makes this so unique. And that's another thing that makes it sound so different from the rest of the, the rest of the max catalog. Maybe the fact that there's one band member less in the band that just helped contribute to these decisions or how they want to make it sonically be presented. And you'd have to ask the players involved how, uh, how that all went down. And sadly, Jack's no longer with us. Mm-hmm. And I asked David about it. I interviewed him for the book. And, uh, but for him, it's just one of 10,000 things he's done in his career. Yeah. And, um, and he just had a couple of memories to share, uh, mainly from a technical perspective of how they did Battle Scar mm-hmm. with putting two 24 track recording you know 24 track you know um consoles together jury rigging them together and then jack Richardson in the middle of the two bands conducting like leonard bernstein and and doing that whole thing so yeah i mean there's you know it's, it's funny i mean we, we we say not a big drum sound but it's but it it has lots of bass and presence i mean it is it is a very it's got it's got the in, entire high fidelity range to it that's one of the beautiful things about this album this beautiful thing about the whole catalog um and and you know as you and i have talked about before we went on guitar hack show right and and yeah. talked about the catalog i mean uh you, you think of high class and you think of million vacations and mutiny and they're some of the greatest sounding albums of the 70s right yeah this is a 1980 album but but this also is really good sounding and even the debut is good sounding but uh i i like you know and this thing about terry not being there there's there's something funny about that where i always even though they weren't the guys that work together a lot uh, there's a sensibility between terry and pie they kind of even look similar right they kind of got just this this uh, this, this yeah. mad scientist sort of look to them right and they yeah. also i think are the more are the more um you know purely artistic creative sort of guys in the band so i think i think with one of those two um you know delightful carnival like presence is missing which is very missing i think that's where you get um almost just uh just a, a loss of some of the playfulness and it sounds a little more claustrophobic um because also as a keyboardist he embodies that same metaphor that uh that sort of cheery almost almost naive and childlike uh, sort of feel that you get out of some of Pi's lyrics. I think you get some of that out of Terry's keyboard work too. Um, you know, as we went through on Guitar Hack, when I was looking at Million Vacations, I, you know, I, I made this analogy that everything sounded like uh, you were up in a hot air balloon, right? Because the keyboards are just so, so bubbly and fresh and optimistic sounding. And with a, with a lot of that missing from here, you know, I don't want to overstate how crazily, heavy this is but it is definitely a guitar bass and drums album right it is and yeah it's funny i i wrote the book on it and, and so did you but we just it's funny how how d- people have different insights into the same thing mm-hmm. and and um yeah i've never thought of similarities between terry and pie but of course it's a unit of course it's a functioning unit mm-hmm. and and um yeah, when when you when you lose Watkinson, just that's that's what that's what goes missing. You're right, that playfulness. I mean, you're right, that side of it isn't quite as there. But what you get in exchange for that though is there's there's a bit of an an angst. And I, I'm thinking of Pink Floyd's Animals right now. You there's a little bit of um, band cohesion that's lost on Floyd's Animals as Waters is now more taking you know taking the reins of the band lyrically. But what you get in exchange for that is just listen to Gilmore's playing. He's got a lot more aggressive edge to his playing on that record. Now. I like that you bring that up because another thing that that happens is that you 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 know Kim is your Frank Zappa esque vocalist or your Roger Waters type vocalist, and Terry is your light and airy Dave, David Gilmore vocalist, right? Yeah. So you're you're missing also that that bubbly light airy quality. I mean, Terry's voice is a metaphor for his keyboard style almost, and as is yeah. a metaphor for Pi's lyrics. So you're kind of missing yeah. a, a triple a triple amount of that uh, hot hot air balloon feel from this album. Yeah, but nothing lasts forever, and and if you want that, the, the previous few albums had that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's easy to just um, just to look at Universal Juveniles as, well, they bridged through Kim's solo career. But just, no, it was not at all. I mean, Kim has said multiple times that he just 
that when he, when he, when he folded the Max Webster thing, he just w- did a bunch of session work and started writing and wanted to join some other band and just maybe just do whatever is on the table. And then nothing really happened and his phone didn't ring. So, okay, I guess I'm going to start my own band. And, you know, but when you, because if you look at discography without knowing the background of it, it's just, okay, band, band, but with one guy on the cover and then one guy, and you can just connect those dots in your head. But that's just, yeah. that's not how it went. It was not nearly but so there's three guys on the back, isn't there? <laughs> <laughs> well, I may be schizophrenic, but at least I have each other. <laughs> yeah. Funny. Yeah. yeah, I know. So I know, but what, but, what, but that, so often people review things for what they're not and what they are. So yeah, we've 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 established that what's not there because Terry isn't there is obviously that. But what is on this album that isn't on the rest of the Max Webster albums? I mean, just so much of of the guitar experimentation that's on there. I mean, you know, the the solo in um, April in Toledo being played on an Ebo, and you know the the end of Juveniles Don't Stop with the two completely different effects having in happening in each channel. And, you know, one's going this way and one's going this way. Mm-hmm. And the, you know, the fade out and cry out for your life at the end. And, and, but the guitar remains, but everything fades out and that note sustains and then everything comes back again. Just this really interesting, innovative ideas happening on this album. That's what is there. Mm-hmm. Besides that, make the case for this being the heaviest Max Webster album. Oh God, just listen to it. Helen Keller could tell this is the heaviest Max Webster album. I mean, <laughs> yeah. just it's just it's bone crunching. Those riffs are huge. I mean, the record starts with in in the world of giants. That's massive, and it's just pow 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 heavy songs. And but I mean, April and Toledo is a little bit lighter, and of course, so is um you know Chalkers, Blue River, Liquor Shine. But but I mean, but just it's it's definitely a guitar dominant album. But but I mean, check just that's that's the heaviest thing so far in, in the catalog if you just played it chronologically through i mean yeah you know beyond the moon's kind of proggy and heavy too but but just but the songs are just heavy they're extremely guitar driven and uh i should have asked kim what uh what kind of amps he was playing through that was different because i don't think it's a Fender twin that he was playing through live i mean it's a pretty heavy sound mm-hmm. that he's got on that record yeah and yep. um and it's just and just i don't know artists go through different phases of of things that that turn their crank and um but that there's nothing else that sounds like that album not only in his catalog but anyone's it's such a it's such a unique outlier that that's a direction that he was trying out and then live when they were on that tour they, he, they got the second guitar player steve mcmurray from wireless and the band becomes even heavier when they play this stuff live with two players there's three or four tapes from that tour it is a huge sound yeah yeah but you don't have dave miles on bass so yeah. then you got you know it's so the sound is changing again but uh, a lot of the writers uh, who, you know, from newspapers, they, they thought this is a really good lineup of the band. And, yeah. and, you know, because it's just, it was heavier. And if you were into metal, if you're into Priest and all that stuff going on then, just, oh, wow, Max Webster has lost that airy thing. And to some people, this was to their advantage. Yeah. And now it's a super heavy, you know, big, big sounding band. Yeah. And it's funny, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm playing these songs in my head, looking at these titles and it's like, it's almost like Gary on the uh, on the previous albums. I can picture him set up in a really, really nice band rehearsal space and, and having mm-hmm. that great sound in the 70s, sort of the, I, I can picture carpet everywhere and super nice mm-hmm. equipment. But here, mm-hmm. when I hear him play and I hear Kim hit those massive chords, you know, the drive and desire, yeah. you know, all that stuff, right? Yeah. It, it sounds more like I'm picturing them in a, in a hockey arena now. Uh, with with the mm-hmm. heaviness of these songs and the drama of these songs, all the all the punctuations and the stops and starts and the complication yes. of something like "Cry Out for Your Life" and "Battle Scar," just how big and doomy and slow it is, right? So it's like it's like Gary's going from this sort of cool '70s high fidelity vibe to this "Wow, we are on stage" sort of vibe. It's epic now, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, it's it's interesting because a lot of a lot of the Max stuff, as we now know, was workshopped on stage. And they played a lot of those songs for years before recording them. I mean, stuff like Beyond the Moon and Research at Beach Resorts and Hawaii. 
Lip Service. I mean, all these songs existed for years when they were a bar band before they became you know, a theater and an arena band. Right. And But then the stuff on Million Vacations and Universal Juveniles, that was written and then recorded and then played live. So there's an interesting shift there that's happening, but especially with the stuff on Universal Juveniles, except for um, Blue River Liquor Shine and Battle Scar. That stuff was all written and wasn't, as far as I know, played live. And so you just wonder, I mean, it's all subconscious, I'm sure, for the artist, but if you ask them now, they, they may not even remember. But, but just in hindsight, it's interesting to look at these things because a lot of time artists are thinking, you know, how can we record this in the studio to make this a great album? And then how can we perform this differently live? And, but, but for a lot of bands, there's no songs were made to be played live and then they just record them. Mm-hmm. And, but the stuff on universal juveniles, it, it feels like it's, it's, um, it's, it's, it's the, it's, it's the, um, how do we record these? And then how do we play them live later? Yeah. And, um, and that's clearly why a second guitar player shows up to cover all these parts. There's no way that, you know, that, that they were going to do in the world of giants with, with one guitar player, but you know, but they did initially. And, um, and, you know, of course the rhythm section is big, but, um, but it just, but it sounds much bigger, of course, when you have a second guitar player, just, you know, holding, holding the fort and playing those heavy rhythm parts. So yeah, Yeah, Max becomes a super heavy band after that band is out or after that record is out. And the other reason this album is, sounds contrary and it and gets underscored as more contrary is that the one right before it is pretty much undoubtedly the mellowest one of them all right the most keyboard yes. the most poppy million vacations really doesn't have any metal on it you know it's got a little bit of heaviness in paradise skies and a little bit of heaviness in rascal hootie but it's kind yeah. of it right million vacations yeah. kind of a rock song but but much of the rest of it is is light airy pomp rock prog right yeah, um, and that was probably Kim feeling like he was perhaps losing a bit of control because John Denopek produced A Million Vacations, and, and he definitely took a lot of the reins, and they trusted him, and he did a great job and made a platinum album for them. Um, but but for sure at that point, I wouldn't be surprised if, if Kim walked into the next one just thinking, okay, maybe I need to be a little more hands-on with this one, and there wasn't as much guitar on this record, and maybe this is direction the direction that this thing needs to go in now. And it's funny that that 40 something years later, it'd be hard to ask anyone, what, where was your mind 40 something years ago? Mm-hmm. You'd have to find some journalist who interviewed them then. And hopefully they asked that kind of question then. And they gave an answer about that then, because mm-hmm. that would be the answer you'd want was them just having come out of doing that then because hindsight and your know, memories and, and emotions can just can change over time. And, and you may not get the clearest answer from someone, even if they have the best of intentions in giving it. And that's what you learn when you write a book and you interview 20 people for it, is that everyone's memories are tempered by their feelings that have happened in between when that thing happened and when they're telling you about it. And it's not a tape machine. So many things can change those. I mean, I read books on memory in the making of my book because when I was interviewing people, I wanted to understand why I was getting three different answers to the same question from three different people. Hmm. But of course they had three different experiences of it. So yeah, yeah, you ask him now what influenced those changes on, on universal juveniles. He might give a much different answer now than he gave back then. And it's not because anyone's trying to change their minds on whatever. It's just because our brains change and our memories and our feelings change over time. So that's been fascinating to get that insight into the human psyche throughout doing this kind of thing. So if you want the answer to that question, you ask him 43 years ago. And then he'll give you a great answer. Well, yeah, yeah, that happened on that album. And here's what I want to do on this album. Yeah. So, yeah. Another funny thing about Psyche with this one as well is that, you know, this is a little bit of one of those give the people what they want albums and also a be careful what you wish for album because you would think on paper most Max Webster fans would would say that this is their best album because it is their heaviest. And most most Max Webster fans are always a little hesitant to go there because for something nags them about this album and it probably is that that lack of Terry and the lack of chemistry. It's a it's a weird 
abstract that maybe they don't even know that they're uh, they're not recognizing. But um, you know, there there's a pile of these with a lot of bands throughout careers where they go and kind of make their heaviest album, um, and and everybody applauds and they've been all complaining about that and wishing for that, and then when they do it, they're not particularly uh, thrilled with it. So uh, yeah, mo- most Max Webster fans will not pick this as as their favorite Max Webster. Album. Some do. I've seen some who do. And um, it's funny, I mentioned Yes earlier. I'm thinking of Drama as probably their heaviest album. Mm-hmm. And uh, But you don't have John Anderson and Rick Wakeman on there, so people have their reasons to not think that's one of their favorite albums. Mm-hmm. But some people love the yeah, Drama album. Too. Yeah, a lot of and and it's, it's heavy. It's mm-hmm. a great, great album. I mean, four, for sure, four of those songs are excellent Yes songs. Mm-hmm. And uh, But that's interesting. And it's the same kind of deal. Tormato was a very light album. And then... You know, bit of a lineup change, understatement, and then just Machine wow. Messiah, Interesting. Tempest Fugit, hugely yeah. heavy songs, you know, by Yes standards. They were a prog mm-hmm. band, yeah. and that's probably their heaviest album they ever did. Yeah. And then, of course, Kim goes on and does this, which is, uh, I'll call it the best EP ever made by anybody ever. And it's got, you know, those five amazing amazing songs on it i mean every oh, yeah. one of those is just a just a banger and i think the chemistry of the band sounds better on here even though it's uh, you know he's got a new band but uh and this yeah. is also four out of five are pretty darn heavy on it right um oh sure so, yeah it's yeah it's bad because album. yeah if this was a full-length album this this would just be probably his biggest masterpiece across both catalogs it's so so perhaps yeah. it's uh it's it's uh, you can only wonder, you know, if there was ever anything caught on the the cutting room floor, and why were those the five songs, and who knows what else was being recorded. Mm-hmm. But um, but my God, but those five songs, oh man, they're yeah, so yeah. good. <laughs> they're sure, just yeah. the arrangements on. I mean, kids in action, get out of here. Just yeah. there's nothing that sounds like that anywhere. Chain the of song events, is so man. great. Oh yeah. man, yeah. man, yeah. The drumming, the, co- the the uh, lyrics, the guitar solo, everything, right? Everything so is so cool. great on that yeah. album. Yeah. I was I was on a trip with a band going into the States and it was one of those we had to get up at 1 30 in the morning type things and to do this drive to get to Memphis. Mm-hmm. And we're all kind of falling asleep in the car and just trying to stay awake and all that. And as soon as we cross the state line into Tennessee. Then the drummer was driving and he puts on Tennessee water and that just bah, got us through the rest of the trip. Oh, nice, nice. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, yeah, on so that good. note, uh, let's wrap up. I mean, everybody, I, uh, you know, we hope you like this episode on, on universal juveniles, check out Max Webb. So they're an amazing, amazing band and check out our guitar hack episode where we, we just, I, we got off that call. We just raved. It's like, we, we just laughed because it was like, I, I don't think I've ever been on a show where, where a bunch of guys raved about a band so much and, and a band that a lot of people probably don't know. And they, you know, you look at that episode and go, man, I got to check out this band. I, I, I felt that feeling more than anything, but uh, yeah, let us know um, in the comments below. If you uh, agree with us uh, that universal, juveniles is uh the band's greatest album and of course before they're all gone get bob's massive book at highclassmax.com um it is absolutely well worth it it's it's an incredible incredible uh you know document of this band so uh without further ado on behalf of bob and myself uh we shall talk to you later go listen to some max